The 1950s was a very good decade for Jaguar cars. The XK sports car was selling extremely well, as was the large saloon. And in 1955, they introduced the medium-sized saloon. But by 1960, they'd run out of production capacity at the Browns Lane site in Coventry and were looking to expand. But the UK government at the time wanted to encourage manufacturing businesses to move to the less developed areas of the countries and refused them permission to expand in Coventry. So William Lyons wasn't having any of this, he wanted to, the entire business to remain in Coventry. So he approached Jack Sangster, who was the chairman of the BSA group who owned the Daimler Motor Company, and asked Sangster if he'd be willing to sell Jaguar cars, the large Radford plant at the north of Coventry. Sangster put this idea to the BSA board who initially said no and asked if Jaguar Cars would be interested in buying the entire company. Sangster put this offer back to William Lyons who readily agreed and the deal was done. But the first the Jaguar board of directors knew anything about it was when they heard it on the BBC News one May morning in 1960. All the due diligence work was completed over the next couple of months and Lyons and Sangster met again in October to finalise all the details. At the last minute, Sangster found out that about £10,000 worth of pension contributions hadn't been included in the numbers, and the two men decided to settle this between them on the toss of a coin, which fortunately Lyons won, saving his company £10,000. I believe this demonstrates that the men were able to conduct their affairs in a gentlemanly fashion. So for just under three and a quarter million pounds, William Lyons had turned his Jaguar car company from just making cars into a manufacturing conglomerate, making cars, buses, trucks, and military vehicles. This is an 1897 Daimler Grafton Phaeton. It was one of the first cars to leave the factory in 1897. And originally it was fitted with tiller steering, but went back to the factory a couple of years later to be fitted with one of these newfangled steering wheels. It's powered by a small two-cylinder engine which predates the advent of spark plugs. In fact, there are no electrics on the car whatsoever. The front and rear lamps are operated by four candles and everyone will recognise the petrol pump as being a simple brass bicycle pump. To start the car, you first need to start a small fire in a firebox in the engine compartment. This heats up a tube and when this tube glows red hot, you can turn the engine over with a starting handle and as the petrol and air mixture is sucked into the engine and reaches the red hot tube, the engine fires and off you go. It's fairly crude, but also fairly reliable, as long as the fire in the firebox doesn't get blown out. You do, however, need to give your chauffeur at least half an hour's notice for him to get the car started and warmed up, ready for you to go anywhere. We've now moved on 10 years. This is a 1907 TP35 and much of the motor industry and car layout has started to become standardised. This car is now fitted with spark plug ignition and electric lights. This engine is water-cooled with a front-mounted radiator topped with a cast tank with integral cooling fins which was to become a Daimler trademark. Braking is much more efficient than on the 1897 with brake bands being pulled onto hubs on the rear wheels instead of just acting on the rear tyres. The tyres on this car are now pneumatic, complete with inner tubes, and tread. This is a sister car of a 1905 Daimler, which set fastest time of day at Chelsea Walsh Hill Climb when it opened. It has been up the hill on a number of occasions since to commemorate this event, most recently in 2018. This is a 1911 TA23, which is very much an evolution of the 1907 car. It's fitted with a Clavelli body, which is described as an enclosed driving limousine. It still has spark plug ignition and electric lights, and is fitted with auxiliary driving lights on the front bulkhead. It is also still fitted with the Daimler trademark radiator with the fins tank on the top. But this car is more important because of the history of its first owner. It was ordered new by Charles Kingston Welsh, who was a serial inventor working in the tyre industry, initially on bicycle tyres but then on motor cars. He invented the beaded rim which stopped the tyres from coming off the wheel rim and he sold his patent to the Dunlop company and went to work for them. 
The number plate on the car is older than the car itself and is the first registration number issued by the Coventry Registration Office. And Welsh bought this as what we would now describe as a personalised plate, presumably to represent his connections with the Dunlop company. Welsh's wife kept the car following his death in 1929, but donated it to the Daimler company in 1946 to take part in the Golden Jubilee celebrations, the 50th anniversary of both the Daimler Motor Company and the British motor industry. Daimler was always renowned for producing limousines, and this car behind me is one of the last made. It's a 1964 Daimler Majestic Major limousine, and although it was built after Jaguar had taken over the company, it is based on a 1950s design and chassis. It's powered by a Daimler engine, originally the 3.5 litre, but later replaced by the 4.5 litre version of the Turner V8. The car has an updated version of the traditional Daimler radiator grille. Instead of the version from the 1910s and 20s where the top of the radiator was actual cooling fins, this is now a stylized radiator grille with chrome ribbon across the top. The car continued in production until 1968 when it was replaced by the Daimler DS420. And although this bore the Daimler badge, it was actually a product of the Jaguar car company. It was based on a Jaguar Mark 10 chassis and it was powered by a 4.2 litre version of the Jaguar XK engine. This is a 1963 SP252 prototype and it's the first example of William Lyons trying to redesign a Daimler product. Daimler had launched their SP250 sports car in 1959, primarily aimed at the US market. It was fiberglass bodied powered by a lightweight 2.5 litre V8 engine. Unfortunately, it never sold very well, partly due to a combination of a lack of a Daimler dealer network, but there were also quality problems with the car suffering from body and chassis flex and doors flying open as the car went round roundabouts. Lines tried to change the design to improve it, it simplified the lines of the car with much smoother lines to the side, a cleaner front end, a much smaller chrome grille. The front lights have a bit of a look of a 1960s Aston Martin or MGB about them. Many of the parts in the car came from the E-Type, the entire interior, the bucket seats, the whole dashboard, and even the front side lights were from an E-Type. Unfortunately, the car never made it to production. Because the body was fiberglass, it was very expensive to produce taken about two and a half times as many man days as the equivalent E-Type. The SP250 itself ceased production at the end of 1964, by which time it had sold 2,654. In contrast to that, from the launch in 1961, Jaguar had sold over 14,000 E-Types by the end of 1964. This is a 1966 Daimler V8 saloon. It didn't take the Jaguar engineers long to realise the potential of the 2.5 litre V8 engine that they'd inherited, and with very little engineering work, they were able to make it fit to the Mark II saloon. The only other changes necessary were to change the spring rates on the suspension, because the engine was lighter than the XK engine that it had replaced. All of the cars were fitted as standard with the Borg Warner automatic gearbox. Externally, there were very few changes to differentiate this from the Jaguar. The fluted radiator grille replaces the plain version from the Jaguar Saloon and the leaper was replaced with a stylized D on the top of the bonnet. Internally there were various other changes to keep up the quality of the Daimler product. So with very little development work, the company was able to produce a brand new Daimler product to keep both the Daimler dealers and the Daimler customers happy. The car actually sold in the dealerships for about 10% more than the equivalent Jaguar product and the 2.5 litre V8 saloon was quicker than the 2.4 litre Jaguar equivalent, although not as quick as the 3.8 saloon. From its launch in 1962 to 1969 when it ceased production, over 18,000 Daimler V8 saloons were built. This is a 1995 Daimler 6 double stretch limousine. The Daimler DS420 limousines were bodied by Vantenplan but when their works closed down in 1979, 
production moved to the Jaguar Cars plant at Browns Lane in Coventry. When Daimler DS420 production ceased in 1992, the Jaguar Daimler company was left without a limousine in their product lineup. In 1995, Special Vehicle Operations built this as a one-off car to see if it was possible to build a viable limousine on the Jaguar X300 platform. The car was stretched in both the front and the rear, hence being called a double stretch. The engine was the same 4-litre six-cylinder as in the standard X300, but the car was effectively kitted out as a mobile office, with mobile phones, which were still relatively unusual in 1995, a Sony video recorder, TVs in the rear of the headrest in the front seats. Unfortunately, the car never went into serial production and no other versions of this were made and independent coach builders took up the mantle of building limousines on the X300 platform. Many of them even longer than this car, some of them with a third row of seats for use on formal and processional occasions. This car was actually used by the Jaguar chairman Nick Shaler for a couple of years as his mobile office. This is a 1996 Daimler Corsica, built to celebrate the centenary of the Daimler Motor Company. It was built as a one-off by the Special Vehicle Operations, the same team who built the double-stretch limousine. Same as the limousine, it started life as an X300 saloon. This time, instead of being lengthened, it was shortened in the center of the car. The roof was chopped off and replaced with an automatic electric hood. A complete new interior was done, and the car was painted in its insignia color of peppermint green. It was originally planned to be a complete running vehicle. Unfortunately, there wasn't time to finish all the work before the centenary celebrations, and the car came to the Jaguar Daimler Heritage Trust for preservation. Then in 2006, 2007, with help from the Jaguar Enthusiast Club and David Mark's garages, the original engine and gearbox were installed in the car. Everything else was made to work, including the automatic hood, and the car went for its first MOT. The car has been used on a regular basis ever since.